Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs. I have a special guest today, Rick Delano. He's a writer and a producer of a recent film called The End of of quantum reality. Uh, he's associated with a site called Philos Sophia. It's at P-H-I-L-O-S dash S-O-P-H-I-A dot org. And you can go there and check out the film. So we're going to talk about the film and uh, what quantum reality means and, and the end of it. So Rick, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So how did you get involved in, in this project? What's um, a bit about your background? Well, uh, my main, the, the main avenue for this film to come into being was uh, when I made my first film about five years ago called The Principle, which was an examination of cosmology and our science of the very large. I kept encountering references to this almost mysterious figure, Wolfgang Smith, who apparently was quite remarkably a genius. I mean, he had been accepted into Cornell at age 14 with majors in math, physics, and philosophy, uh, had gotten his... uh, graduate degree in quantum mechanics by the time he was 20 and was teaching mathematics at MIT by the time he was 25 and and had written this extraordinary book, The Quantum Enigma. And having dealt with the science of the very large in cosmology, I had hoped to follow that up with an examination of our science in the very small quantum mechanics, what that means, what, what quantum physics is telling us about reality. And so I just uh, started looking around to try to find if anybody could find this guy because he had retired and pretty much gone into seclusion uh, about a decade ago. I was able to track down his publisher in New York. And strangely enough, because his publisher had seen the principal, uh, he passed my inquiry along to Dr. Smith, who usually does not communicate with people who get in touch with him through his publisher. And lo and behold, we started to communicate via telephone. A great friendship ensued. I read all of his books and discussed them in detail with him and became convinced at a pretty early stage that uh, somebody had to document this man uh, before he leaves this world. So uh, one thing led to another, and here we are today. So what, what is the, I mean, now that you've studied Wolfgang, <clears throat> I don't know, what are some of the main things that you've learned from his teachings? What are some of the, you know, that, that are, I guess, change, you, know, uh, you know, not commonplace, but very disruptive to the way that people may see the world right now? What have you learned? Well, it is probably the single most disruptive thing to the way we see the world right now is possible to imagine. Because if there is one fundamental thing that essentially everybody in the world believes right now, it is that the world is made up of these fundamental particles, call them atoms, call them quantum uh, stuff, call them whatever you want, but probably the most widespread belief in the world today is that science has shown us that the world is ultimately founded upon these fundamental particles. And this assumption, because that's what it is, it's a metaphysical assumption, was enormously successful during the entire run of the scientific era, about 400 years now. And we went from triumph to triumph. We, we constantly got better and better able to look down and try and find these fundamental particles. And in fact, at the very end of the 19th century into the beginning decades of the 20th century, we did find it. And that is where the story becomes so weird that even 100 years later, it's very difficult to get people to truth. What we found was that when you finally get down to this fundamental level of physics, that world is completely bonkers as far as our assumptions about the world in which we live and move and have our being. There seems to be an absolute fundamental disconnect between the equations which govern that world and the equations which govern this world. 
And of course, well, this is what, you, what they, do you mean? You mean Newtonian versus exactly. quantum effects? Okay. E exactly. The Newtonian world describes a world that is perfectly consistent with our intuition. If you shoot a cannonball out of a cannon, that cannonball is going to be someplace on that trajectory at every moment. You can use Newton's equation to calculate what that trajectory is going to be, and that's why you can land the cannonball on the other guy, stupendous energy. This is simply not the case with the quantum world. There are no trajectories. There is no way to say that the particle is here or the particle is there at any particular moment, except when you do one thing. And that one thing, of all things, is measurement. And this has bedeviled and puzzled physicists ever since Werner Heisen first formulated quantum in 19... Are you, um, I have a quick question. We, you know, I, this is not meant to be an insult, but hopefully you're a bit older than I am. Have you, do you know anyone that was able to talk to Werner Heisenberg? Or, I, you know, I would always would have loved to have heard from him yeah, or well, someone that spoke to him what, I, what he thought. I got pretty close with Wolfgang because Wolfgang was at Cornell when Richard Feynman was at Cornell. Oh, cool. And, Wolf, and some of Wolfgang's professors at Cornell actually had been in personal contact with uh, uh, Heisenberg and Bohr, uh, not to mention Einstein and, uh, and Dirac. So he was at Cornell at a time when the very first generation of quantum theorists were sort of passing the torch. And so he received his training in quantum mechanics with a degree of rigor that I think is extremely rare today. And because of his philosophical bent, he profoundly understood not only the mathematics of quantum mechanics, which are profound, it's by far the most accurate physical theory in the history of the world, by far, almost spookily accurate. I mean, they've calculated the magnetic moment of an electron to 13 decimal places. That is a degree of precision that is absolutely unknown to physics prior to quantum mechanics. So he became very convinced early on that, first of all, quantum mechanics is a correct physical theory. And more important, because he studied Heisenberg's formulation and approach very, very carefully, he understood that beyond the mathematics, quantum mechanics had something to tell us about the nature of the world. Specifically, the reason for this puzzling discontinuity between the world of the physicist, the world of quantum mechanics, and the world in which we experience, um, you know, we, we don't see each other multilocating here, but quantum mechanics tells us that we should. Uh, that all of the particles which make us up are governed by the Schrodinger equation or by the Heisenberg density matrix, both of which end up giving you the same outcome. And according to these equations, every particle that makes us up is subject to the laws of quantum mechanics, but we don't live in that world. That world, we, we, don't, we don't perceive that world. We live in a world where the table is in one place, and the uh the, well we're the, also uh, i mean we're also so macroscopic compared to you know quantum effects that i would think even if it's happening you know even if a, a person's position is many positions at once the, the 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 actual distance of the range in which their positions are different is so small on a macroscopic level that we just you know it's right to perceive them as being in one spot or I'm is that a wrong yeah i'm afraid there's a serious problem with that assumption under that assumption, it is simply a matter of getting enough of these quantum particles together, and then somehow magically at some point, they stop being quantum and suddenly become classical. And we know for a fact that's not true. We have many experiments now where very large collection of quantum particles, for example, a Bose-Einstein condenser, uh, but many other experiments, where we are now getting to the macroscopic scale and we are still able to observe quantum effects in these systems. This was Wolfgang's great criticism of Heisenberg, because Heisenberg did quantum mechanics by making a very powerful assumption. He said, there is an absolute discontinuity between the quantum system and the world. 
and the world includes the measuring. And his mathematics are very, very clear. If you're going to measure a quantum system, you have to have what they call a cut, in German, a schmidt, a cut between that system which you are going to measure and the rest of the world, including the detector, which means the detector does not obey quantum mechanics. It's different. And because it is different, Heisenberg was required to say, sort of wave his hands and say, well, you know, I treat these quantum systems as if they were, he actually uses the word potentia. In other words, they do not have the degree of reality that, for example, this computer has or this table has. That's fundamental to his formulation of quantum mechanics. There is this fundamental discontinuity between the quantum system and the world apart from the quantum. And this, of course, is a big problem for physicists. Because physicists want the world to ultimately reduce to these fundamental particles. And the problem is we have this profound discontinuity. The Schrodinger equation or the Heisenberg density matrix perfectly describe a quantum system right up until you measure it. That is to say, right up until you bring it into physical contact with a measuring device. And that measuring device somehow for some reason, instantaneously collapses that cloud of probability, which is exactly what it is uh, under quantum mechanics. It's not a particle here or a particle there. It is a collection of probability of where a, pr a particle might be if it were to be measured. Quantum mechanics is very clear. That quantum system does not own a location, does not own a velocity, does not own any of its dynamic attributes. It's exactly the opposite of Newton's cannonball. Newton's cannonball owns its dynamic attributes at every point along that trajectory. Quantum mechanics tells us that these fundamental particles don't own any of their dynamic attributes at all, at any time, up until they come into contact with a measuring device. Yeah, Suddenly, but they, they, they do have a range of location, they have a range of speed, they have a range of other properties, right? It's just no, that they, they don't have, have one definitive they have, one, I would thought. They have no location whatsoever. They have no velocity whatsoever. What they I have, thought there's a, like, there's a wave function and stuff. And it's that's like a probability precisely right. Yeah. What they have is a cloud of probabilities associated with them, which absolutely requires us to give up on any attempt to say, it's here, it's going this fast, it's in this location. None of those things can be predicated of that quantum system until measured. And then instantly, upon measurement, strangest bloody thing in the history of the world. All of a sudden, at the very instant of measurement, that so-called wave function collapses. There's a complete discontinuity between the linear Schrodinger equation or the Heisenberg and the outcome of that measurement is the outcome of that measurement is fundamentally non-linear. It is absolutely impossible to derive that value from either the Schrodinger equation or the Heisenberg matrix. It is a discontinuity, a formal discontinuity. The pre-measured and post-measured system are absolutely fundamentally different from each other in a profound way. So this has always been the quantum reality problem. Because when we say the word reality, right, we have, to, we have to mean something. There has to be something that we mean when we say reality. And if we decide that reality is that which satisfies quantum mechanics, we have a terrible puzzle in this so-called measurement problem. What nobody did until Wolfgang Smith was to take it from the other side. Even Heisenberg ultimately held to the idea that reality must fundamentally be in these particles. Even though his own mathematics required us to draw a, a sharp distinction, a cut, between the quantum world and the world of the detector and the rest of it. Nonetheless, Heisenberg sort of waved his hands about and said, well, you know, on their own, each one of these things really is not existing at all. It's, it's a, it's a potential. It's not an actuality. It's a possibility. 
But if you somehow stack enough of these possibilities together, somehow at some magic number, nobody really knows what the magic number must be, but at that magic number, somehow you are supposed to suddenly be in act. All of a sudden, you're not in potential. You're in actualization. That is a very fuzzy and indeed a, uh, a problematic notion. So Wolfgang looked at this from the other direction, which is a very wise thing to be a based paradox that has persisted a so, hundred years. Well, what's the implication of this then? What, what new clarity does this give you? So we are trying to build our world out of quantum mechanics, and we are now hitting what I would consider to be extremely big red flag warning. The most popular interpretation of what quantum mechanics means among our theoretical physicists is what they call the many worlds or the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. And this is so absurd that you have to have at least three postgraduate degrees before you can even read it without starting to laugh. Which, by the way, is not an argument against it. Don't get me wrong. The mere fact that it's absurd certainly doesn't rule it out. Physics is full of things that have appeared to be absurd. But it is profoundly troubling because ultimately what this requires us to believe at the very bottom of that pool, every time any one of us collapses a wave function, that means every time we blink our eye, what we are doing is collapsing the wave, is, is branching the universe into as many branches as there were possible value to all of the observables of all of those trillions upon octillions upon Google Plex of particles. That's how many universes come into existence every time of quantum measurement. Now, needless to say, that is not a very compelling <coughs> ontology. We have no evidence of this, none at all. We, we see no evidence right, whatsoever right. of this, this branching. Nonetheless, if you insist upon the fundamental basis of reality being the quantum world to go, you're forced to a view of reality that is so profoundly at odds with our everyday experience and with the collected wisdom of humanity from the beginning of time. Let's just say that there are solid grounds, I think, for doubt about the truth of this many worlds interpretation. Now, it gets a little even worse than that, I would say. More recently, you know, it, it has been accepted because the, the mathematics allow it. Right? It's certainly true that the mathematics do allow it. There's nothing in the mathematics of Everett's many worlds theory that contradicts um, the uh, possibility that every time we blink, we're splitting the universe up into several octillion copies. The mathematics does allow for that but we don't observe it, we don't see it. There's another problem. And this one, I think, you know, I mean, it's early in the day, you don't want to get too far out over your skis on these things. And I'm not a specialist, so, you know, I can only report what the specialists are saying. Right. There is a very interesting argument that is beginning to make its way into the published journal. And this argument is so simple that um, it's, it's getting some traction. The argument is this. It is well established that in statistical mechanics, the physics of gases, there is something called the Boltzmann. It's a well-established principle of physics. And the Boltzmann constant imposes certain limitations on just how you treat these fundamental particles. It's related to thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, the amount of heat dissipation that is associated with a process, statistical gas, is directly related to the degrees of freedom that the theory assigns to each of the molecules. The more degrees of freedom that there are, the higher the heat dissipation that we would observe is going to turn out to be. Now here's where it gets interesting. Quantum mechanics exactly agree with all of the provable. It does that because it has a very limited degree of freedom of action of its particles. The way quantum mechanics is structured, most of the possibilities are ruled out by the theory itself. The way you do matrix mechanics, the way you do the Schrodinger equation, the wave function, rules out most of the degrees of freedom for that particle upon actualization. That's why it fits the Boltzmann. But many worlds 
according to this new argument, profoundly violate that Boltzmann because the degree of freedom required for the particles to branch off and create all of these different worlds all of which have a detector giving a different answer to the measurement that we that requires orders of magnitude more degrees of freedom than the particle and in the branching process itself than quantum mechanics allow and so these degrees of freedom translate according to these new papers into violations so, so very, so very basically theory. quantum mechanics says Many worlds hypothesis, no, it's not right. Yeah, the, the, the theorists who are sticking strictly to quantum mechanics say that they have found a smoking gun that will differentiate standard quantum mechanics, which works every... There has never been an experiment that has ever contradicted quantum mechanics. Every single time quantum mechanics has been put to the test, it has worked. And what these theorists who are talking about the degrees of freedom in these other formulations like the Boolean mechanics and the many worlds, what they are saying is they have discovered that the degrees of freedom necessary in the particle would result upon measurement in a violation of the Boltzmann constant. So that's pretty big. I mean, we'll see if it stands up. I'm certainly not a specialist. Uh, all I can do is tell you that, you know, I have read the argument uh, several times in several papers and on several blogs, and it strikes me as profoundly compelling. It's pretty simple. It's, it's, it's not really all that complicated. Well, I'm, I can't tell you exactly why, but it seems like the many worlds hypothesis is a, you know, my back is against the wall. Yeah. Uh, there's many worlds and that gets me out of trouble type of exactly. hypothesis. I, I completely agree with you. And of course, you know, I want to be careful here. I don't want to claim more than I can claim. But I also don't want to claim less than I can. At the end of the day, we have to live in the world and we have to make sense of the world, which means we can't just toss out quantum mechanics because it bloody well works. We're having this conversation today because quantum mechanics is stupendous physical theory. But on the other hand, the world that we live in is profoundly unquantum mechanical. And this has been, by the best thinkers, this has been understood from Einstein forward, this has been the great puzzle of quantum mechanics. So there's really two ways to go here. You can say that quantum mechanics is not a complete physical theory. There's something more that lies underneath quantum mechanics. And these are all basically called hidden variables. A bone is a hidden variable theory. Many worlds is a hidden variable theory. And what all these theories have in common is that they postulate things underneath quantum mechanics that we can't observe. There's no experiment that can show them, but we need them because they get rid of this measuring. They get rid of this paradoxical collapse of the wave function, which is irreducibly found in standard classical quantum mechanics. Well, it we seems pay like, it, it seems to me there's many velvet ropes, I guess you could say, that we can't go beyond. You know, we can't get to absolute zero. We can't get, well, even close to the speed of light. We can't get to 99.999% of the observable universe. We can't get too fast or too small or too this or too that. I mean, it just seems like, you know, our, I don't know. I don't know how we're ever going to get beyond a whole host of these boundaries. Well, Wolfgang has a suggestion. We can get beyond. Because the, according to Wolfgang and his argument and the film's argument, there's nothing wrong with quantum mechanics. These guys are trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. Quantum mechanics is a correct theory of what Wolfgang calls the physical universe. Now, I want to make a distinction. Most people, when they hear physical universe, they think that's the solid table in front of you. No, that is not the physical universe, because the physical universe ultimately is the universe as disclosed to us by methods and procedures and assumptions of the physicist. The physical universe is a very different place than the world in which we live. So Wolfgang calls the physical universe that universe which the physicists described. And it is a very different universe than the universe in which we are sitting and talking right now over the table. In this universe, there's no multi-location. There's color, texture, sound, beauty, all of these 
quality that are nowhere to be found in the physical. So either you try and get to this world by quantum mechanics, which requires additional assumption added to the theory in the form of hidden variables, and you pursue that, you're going to wind up with either many worlds or Bohmian mechanics or some of the flash collapse theories or the real end of the line, super determinism. All of these theories are ultimately, in my personal opinion, and, and you, know, you, you have also expressed an intuitional discomfort with what these things are telling us about the nature of reality. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable to assume that the way the world really is is that we blink our eyes and the universe splits off into as many copies of itself, trillions and trillions of copies every time we blink our eyes. We don't feel comfortable with that. And there's a very good reason, because that's not what we experience. So what Wolfgang has done is he has turned the entire question right side up, in my opinion. What if the world that the physicists have discovered is not the fundamental bound of reality? What if reality is not bubbling up out of the quantum back and splitting off into many worlds? What if, in fact, reality is what we are actually perceiving around us? And the only way to really make sense of the quantum world is to do it just the way Heisenberg did, to assume that there's a sharp dividing line between the world of the physicist, the world of quantum mechanics, and the world of the particle detector and everything else, what Heisenberg calls the environment. Well, here's where Heisenberg's clues really find their full elaboration in the work of Wolfgang Smith. Heisenberg said famous, profound insight. He said, the quantum particles really remind him of nothing so much as a quantitative version of the old idea of Aristotelian potential. The old classical view of reality was that you had matter, and matter isn't hard stuff that you can bang on. That's not what matter is put in traditional school. Matter is a principle of receptivity. Form must be added to matter in order for us to get a substantial object, a being, if you will. And Heisenberg was smart enough to see that what he was finding down here in the realm of quantum particles was very reminiscent of this ancient idea of matter as a receptive principle. Something has to act upon that material principle that is a potential and turn it from potency into act. And the thing that actualizes a potency in quantum mechanics is a measurement. And what is the special thing about a measurement? It involves a device that itself should be made of quantum particles, but yet there has to be something more there, because if it was only made of quantum particles, it wouldn't collapse the wave function. It itself a, would have been the wave function. I, I have a quick question here. So could you add to the definition of life, a living thing is something that, that can reduce potentia to, to matter, that can make an observation? Could that be the definition of a living thing? Well, um, I'd have to think about that. Um, what I think you're trying to get at is the idea that consciousness plays a role in this whole thing. Is that what you're, is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, partially, yeah. Okay. Well, that can't be true. And again, it comes down to a distinction that very few modern physicists are careful to observe, but Heisenberg was absolutely critical. There are two things that have to be separated out to understand Heisenberg. On the one hand, we talk about the collapse of the wave function, right? And the collapse of the wave function for Heisenberg is something entirely different than what happens with a measurement. What Heisenberg describes as happening when a physical system comes into contact with a measuring. He calls this the actualization of potentia. In other words, the potentialities of the quantum system come into contact with the measuring device, and instantaneously, these potentiae are actualized. The potentiae collapse down into one specific point on a needle, one specific click on a diagram, one specific track on a clown chip. This is the collapse of the of the potentiae down into an actuality. Now, there's a subtle point here. It's really important. 
Many people refer to that collapse of the wave function indiscriminately. In other words, the wave function only collapses when the observer becomes aware of the result. Well, that's true because the wave function is describing our knowledge about the system. It's true. The wave function describes our knowledge about the system. And that knowledge is updated only when the observer becomes aware of the result of the measurement. But here's the point. If you are doing a quantum experiment and you set up your electron gun to start shooting electrons through a double slit, and then you go downstairs and you have a cup of coffee, each and every time that electron gun fires, it is leaving an impact on your detector. That wave function may not collapse until you come back from your cup of coffee and update your knowledge of the system. But the potential are being actual every time the electron hits the detector. So there's a distinction. Yeah, actually, there. wait, wait a second. You know, if someone did, right, the double slit experiment and they were able to um, remove the detector after it had run for a period of time, and only observe the detector, but not go into the room and observe the results of, you know, of the photons being fired or whatever it was. Has anyone done that and what has been observed? Oh, yeah, no, in these, that those case? experiments are done all the time. They, these so kind of experiments are generally called Wigner's friend type experiments, and they involve various steps along the path to the measurement. And you can delay the observers uh, becoming aware of this. And But one thing I can tell you to simplify this, don't take my word for it, but if you check, you're going to find this is absolutely the case. None of these types of experiments, delayed choice experiments, quantum eraser type experiments, not a single one of these experiments contradict quantum mechanics because not a single one of these experiments changes the measurement. At the end of the day, you have to measure the system to get a result. Now, that measurement can take place while you're downstairs having a cup of coffee. The measurement has occurred. The potentiality has been actualized. It's sitting there waiting for you when you come back upstairs from your cup of coffee and you say, ah, so now I have an answer. Now I have to update my knowledge of the system in order to do quantum mechanics on its up state. For Heisenberg, that knowledge and that update constitutes the collapse of the wave function. But the actualization of the potential, that occurred while you were still downstairs having the cup of coffee. So when people have observed a, a detector in that instance, I don't know, could they tell anything was different about the detector? Could they tell what had happened in the room by the looking only, at the, the only way to tell The only way to tell the difference as to whether there was a detector on one of those slits or not is that you'll see a different pattern. When the detector is there, you get one kind of when the detector is not there, you get a different thing. That's fascinating. I mean, that really, really is fascinating. Why should it be that the mere fact that a detector is present is going to change the outcome of your experiment? But when you think about it, that's exactly what quantum mechanics told us from the very beginning, that measurement is the thing that actualizes the potential. And then when the observer comes back and makes the notes in his notebook to update the values that were obtained in the measurement, then you have a collapse of the wave function. You have to. But is there any, any difference between a, um, a measurement where the measurer is the one, you know, let's say sending a photon into the system versus the measurer simply receiving a photon that's been expelled by the system? Does any it difference matter? There? It doesn't matter if it's an observer with a brain or just a detector, a Geiger counter, or any other kind of device that interacts with the system and registers an outcome. Doesn't matter. Whether there's anybody there to look at the detector or not, doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is whether there is a corporeal substance there, something that involves the substantial form that differentiates the world we live in from the quantum domain. Anytime a quantum system comes into contact with one of these measuring devices, that outcome, the actualization of the potential is going to occur, whether anybody's there to look at it or not. And that's profound. Mm -hmm. So what Wolfgang says is that what this is telling us is that there really is an ontological gap between the world of quantum phenomena 
and the world that he calls the corporeal, the world of substantial form. And again, this ties back into Heisenberg because Heisenberg understood that the difference between a quantum system and a measuring has to be that the measuring device cannot be treated as a potential. It has to be treated as an actuality. And that is why Wolfgang says the resolution of the quantum enigma is not found in trying to build the world out of these quantum systems. The resolution of the quantum... The, why, why couldn't you have a, you know, a coherent quantum system and it does the measuring? You know, something happens that, I don't know, causes the system to decohere, and by that you make a measurement. Would that be any different? Well, that's, that, that's what happens every time we do a measure. It comes into contact with a device that, first of all, decoherence is not measurement. There's a difference there, and it's an important one, and it's often uh, sort of uh, ignored in lay discussion. Decoherence is a process whereby a quantum system comes into contact with the environment, but not a measurement, right? And the outcome is different. The outcome of decoherence is not the outcome of a measurement. The difference is this. Measurement is that which takes a quantum system of potentiae and collapses the chosen observable down to one specific value with probability one. There is a 100% probability that your particle is here after a measurement, if you're, if you're measuring location, right? The only measurement does that. Decoherence does not do that. What decoherence does is it destroys the superposition in the quantum system and renders the probabilities classical rather than quantum. So when you have decoherence in a quantum system, you have destroyed the superpositions in that system such that the probabilities associated with that system are now classical probabilities. For example, thermodynamic, uh, statistical mechanics. These are the, are the probabilities that we are encountering now that decoherence has occurred. But that process has not reduced the probabilities to 100%. Only measurement does that. But they do have one thing in common. Both of them involve the interaction of a quantum system with the environment, with something that obviously is not a quantum system because the quantum system decoheres, loses its quantum character loses its superposition when it comes into contact with this environment. Wolfgang's great insight is to show that it is the actual contact of the physical system with a corporeal entity, whether that is a measuring device or the air or any other corporeal substance, any other thing that actually has being in the Aristotelian sense. Always the quantum system loses, always the corporeal system wins in every single case. Therefore, the attempt to build the world out of quantum particles has failed in Wolfgang's view. What we are left with is these tremendous paradoxes like many worlds. You know, the moon isn't there until you look at it. But these yield, in their own way, tremendous difficulties. They don't describe the world in which we live. On the other hand, if there is a world of substantial form that emanates not from the forms of causality recognized by physics, horizontal form, forms of causality that are implicit in differential equation, if there is some form of causation that is acting discontinuously, instantaneously, and in a non-linear fashion to create this sudden collapse of the potential into actual substance. Now we have a resolution of the quantum enigma that allows us to do quantum mechanics until the cows come home, enjoy all of the benefits of quantum mechanics, and yet recover the real world as a superior and ontologically superior domain to that sub-existential domain of the quantum physics. And that is the essence of Wolfgang's solution to the quantum and of course, well, it's very. Any, I mean, so what, what does this tell you to do experimentally? What What's the practical implications of this? What can be done with it? Well, the practical, impl the, the practical implications are the most important one is every single attempt 
from now until the end of time to construct a physical theory of everything is doomed to fail. Every dollar you put into that will be a waste. You are putting money down empty whole. It will be impossible, not because you're not a good enough mathematician or because you don't think of a clever enough experiment, but because of the nature of reality itself. It will be impossible to derive a theory of everything because the physicist is limited to a part of the world that is sub-existential. And the form of causation that we see in, in a measurement is vertical. It comes from above. The higher domain of substance, being, form, essence, this higher domain is actually ontologically superior to the lower domain of physics. Therefore, the first practical uh, lesson of this resolution is that the physicists who are trying to reduce the world to an equation are pursuing a, an empty hole. They'll never get there. This leads to many more interesting uh, practical considerations. Because if there is, in fact, a form of causality disclosing itself to us every time we measure a quantum system in the laboratory, and that form of causation is unknown to physics, then we would expect a paradox. The form of causation would present itself to us precisely in the form of a paradox. Why should this be happening? It doesn't make sense. Well, of course it doesn't make sense, because you are attempting to write differential equations to describe a world that does not reduce to differential equations. So now we have a very interesting boundary. And I would argue that most of the great advances in physics that lie ahead of us are going to be explorations of this interesting boundary between the quantum world and the corporeal world. Some of these experiments are already being done. It's obviously crucial to quantum computing. We have to explore this boundary if we're ever going to have real quantum computing. Uh, and some of the most interesting work being done is in optics and in materials, uh, nanotechnology materials, where this boundary between the corporeal and the physical uh, shows up in every experiment that we are attempting to do. And I think that's where the next, that's where the ball game is going to be in physics. Well, very good. We're, um, you know, we're out of time right now, but uh, where can people uh, watch this movie? You know, should they go to the Philosophia website or? Yeah, where can they well, go? To thank, thank you so much for asking, Rich. <laughs> yeah, they can go to www.theendofquantumreality.com. The film is available there in many different ways. You, know, you get it on disc, Blu-ray, you can get it on the digital download, you can get it on a stream rental. Um, you know, many, many options for that. And uh, we're delighted to say, and we're very humbled and grateful to say, the film is off to a gangbusters start so uh anyone who has an interest in exploring this profoundly interesting man wolfgang smith and his uh his, his research on this question uh can find it uh, there. well very good thank you for coming on the podcast and i really appreciate it thank you so much richard have a great day you've been listening to the finding genius podcast with richard jacobs if you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.